Socialist realism is an art form that came out of the Soviet Union during the rule of Joseph Stalin. From there, this weird and somewhat self-satirizing form of art pretty much spread throughout the communist bloc states into every single communist nation with a leader cult, where it still, to some extent, prevails to this very day. To say it is politicized would be an understatement. It's art that serves no other purpose than to be political. Whilst the rest of Europe went through artistic revolutions, art in the Soviet Union stagnated and resembled dull works from the past. Art that separates itself from aesthetic norms and caution can really exist only in a free and open society and not within a dictatorship, because dictators are by definition weary of everything that they can't dictate. As such, artistic liberty was removed from the Soviet Union and the art coming out of the Soviet Union became this, dull, dictated depictions with straightforward literal messages serving the purpose of showcasting the supposed reality within the Soviet Union, pictures and paintings that are not there to be interpreted and viewed but to be accessed and read with absolute zero room for interpretation. Of course, the inherent flaw of socialist realism is that it is inherently unrealistic. It proclaims to represent reality within the Soviet Union, yet as much as socialist realists would paint sceneries of, for example, bountiful harvests produced by happy singing farmers, the famine that ravaged through the Soviet Union during the same time, killing millions due to the forced collectivization of agriculture, remained frighteningly real, no matter how much the socialist realists tried to paint it away. When creating art purely for the purpose of furthering an ideology and serving an ideology, reality becomes irrelevant and fantasies start to be celebrated in ways that are almost self-satirical, celebrating bountiful harvests where there are none, celebrating laborers where there is forced labor, celebrating political discourse where dissenters are shot, celebrating leisure where there is none, celebrating education where half the population is illiterate. Everything starts to turn into a farce and self-satire. Take a look at this painting of Georgi Shukov, the Soviet general who prevented the Japanese from invading the Soviet Union and who was the strategic mind behind defeating the Nazis on the Eastern Front. He is depicted on horseback during the most mechanized war in human history. And if you look closely, you will also notice how the swastikas on the flags of the defeated were inverted, which in case you wonder was not a mistake but a gesture of political correctness and self-censorship by the painter to not offend the ideological critics of it. So in the end, the supposedly revolutionary art which the Soviet Union was proclaiming to produce was nothing more than the same reactionary garbage that the monarchs who preceded them had produced. And this art form of socialist realism is something that I keep thinking about as a comparison when I am confronted with the art produced by social justice warriors today. As much as kids who are financed through college for worthless degrees by their parents like to clumsily lament their supposed current oppression and struggles, the economic decline and resulting widespread poverty throughout the Western world remains frighteningly real. Actual misery, poverty and injustice are irrelevant. Just as the Stalinist socialist realists focused on lavish depictions of what should be, the social justice slam poet whinges on about how oppressed she should be rather than calling out what the actual reality is. Stuffing a trans character into a game with forced dialogue, not because trans people are oppressed, but because the forced narrative is something that should be. 
and by lamenting what should be based on delusions rather than confronting or lampooning reality, their so-called art turns into self-congratulatory, condescending gibberish, serving no other purpose but to please the modern-day campus politburo. There have been artists before with political motives who called for things that should be. Let's take as an example the chorus of the Hebrew slaves from the opera Nabucco by Giuseppe Verdi. The opera tells a biblical story and the chorus is sung by Hebrew slaves lamenting their sorrow of not being in their homeland and their longing to finally come home. This chorus is directed at the Italian people, who at the time had no nation but were subjects of various states and puppet states belonging to the Catholic Church, the Austrian Empire and the Spanish Kingdom. The chorus is a manifesto for the Italian people to take their homeland back, as they did twenty years later during the Italian Revolution. To this day, the chorus is still considered to be somewhat of an unofficial anthem of Italy. Verdi hid the message by telling a biblical story in an Italian opera house, whilst making the Italian people the modern-day Hebrew slaves. I will leave a link to the chorus in the description if you wish to hear it. When promoting a political message through artistic expression, the way in which the political message is hidden within the artwork is almost an art within itself. Alternatively, one can also be blunt and simply tell the story of an injustice and its consequences. Take God's Little Acre by Erskine Caldwell. It tells the story of a dirt poor cotton farmer and his family in impoverished Georgia after the, of the great financial crisis. The father is driven into such despair by the poverty he is forced to endure that he is driven into delusions, hallucinations and madness as he digs increasingly bigger and deeper holes all throughout his little property, convinced that there must be gold somewhere beneath the soil that would end his family's misery. And in his absence his children start having incestuous relationships and end up murdering each other at the end of the plot. By bluntly telling the story, Caldwell points out the personal misery and cost of extreme poverty caused by the financial crash, as well as the resulting moral decay. And this is achieved without directly addressing the underlying causes or political message in any way. The story is simply told, and the reader has to conclude himself. This way of bluntly calling out injustices through a plot without directly making any kind of ideological speech is found in many examples of literature. A portrait of the artist as a young man, Wittgenstein's nephew, Mother Courage and her children, the grapes of wrath. Telling a story is enthralling whilst being preached to is nothing more but condescending. And in the end I would like to return to the Soviet Union on the Stalin. All these paintings you have seen in the beginning of this video made by laughable boot-licking lackeys preaching to the Politburo in an attempt to gain favours are unknown nobodies today. Who remembers the name of some party hack who painted a farmer's harvest whilst famine was raging through the Soviet Union? Nobody. Yet a book that remains widely known from that time period and is considered to be one of the greatest works of the 20th century in terms of literature and possibly even one of the greatest works of satire of all time is The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov. Written in secret and with a firing squad being the probable reward had he pub published it, in it Satan comes to earth in the Soviet Union, in Moscow specifically, under Stalinist rule, confuses the masses with, with his magic tricks and causes widespread chaos, which the Soviet bureaucracy frantically tries to explain away in unlaughable attempts by trying to rationalize the devil and his deeds. The book lampoons the Soviet bureaucracy and its closed-minded nat nature brilliantly. 
Mockery is one of the best ways of unmasking those responsible for an injustice, but I guess it is fair to say from previous encounters that the only humour these people are capable of is involuntary self-satire. Because a party book and its buzzwords can never be an artwork, it always ends up being self-congratulatory gibberish, an attempt of trying to create a political speech that doesn't look like a political speech. And the thing I have been thinking about is what we are encountering here in our time, a return of socialist realism, or is it something new? And if it is new, what do we call it? Anti-social realism?